Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today's webinar is Cookie Cutter Compliance, a Recipe for Disaster. My name is Mike Annan. I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over some webinar housekeeping tips that we go over every time. So uh, bear with me for just a few. Um, everyone in the audience is currently on mute and will remain so throughout the recording. Please use the chat window to uh, inform us uh, of any audio or technical issues that you're experiencing. Uh, if you are having sound issues, we re recommend calling in via phone rather than using your computer's audio. Uh, we'll conduct several live polls throughout the webinar, so please join us because it helps us tailor our presentation to better suit your needs. And then throughout the webinar, please use the question feature to ask questions about any topics being discussed. Don't wait till the end. If something occurs to you, just go ahead and, and ask that question and we'll get to it in the Q&A section. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and a link to an edited version will be sent to all the intent attendees post event so i would like to take this opportunity now to introduce the hippotrex ceo and founder sarah badman sarah it's a pleasure to have a have you with us today please tell everybody a little bit about your journey Thanks, Mike. I am so happy to be back here. I always have so much fun doing these with you. Um, so I actually came from healthcare administration. So I worked um, in healthcare clinics um, and other ambulatory settings, as well as in the HIM department of a CAW uh, before I founded Hippotrek to solve my own compliance needs. And then very shortly after founding Hippotrek, we actually partnered up with Y'all Armor, who host all of our information and give us all this great security information, which we are so excited to be partners with you. Fantastic. Well, I always enjoy having you on too, because you know I learn so much every time that we talk and I know everyone that's attending today is going to as well. So let's look real quick at the things we're gonna talk about today um, on the agenda slide. We're going to talk about some strategies and how to keep your recipes for compliance updated. We'll talk about some solutions, customizing, customizing your family recipes to keep them updated as well. Uh, we're going to talk about some substitutions and how not to skimp on good ingredients. We'll talk about some sticky situations that you need to avoid. We'll go over some helpful resources from both Armor and Hippotrek, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So, before we begin the, the meat of the recipe, let's start with a poll question. Yes. So how are you currently keeping up with the changes to compliance regulations? We know in healthcare, the compliance regulations are changing quickly. We have information blocking now under cures. We have new HIPAA updates coming. So how are y'all keeping up to date with those? Are you following social media accounts? Are you subscribed to newsletters? Do you regularly check on the OCR? Or you, do you just not know what to do? So it's not unique just to uh, healthcare. Every, uh, it seems like every regulatory requirement is changing. I know that High Trust is releasing version 10 this year. PCI is releasing version four. Uh, the new Rev5 for NIST came out just recently. So. Yeah, if you uh, are not keeping up, then things are going to run by you very quickly. Yeah, you're going to find it pretty difficult. So let's see here. So most people subscribe to new to email newsletters. That's awesome. That's so that's fantastic. a great way of keeping up. What are some other ways we can keep up, Mike? So there are certainly things that you can do to keep abreast of changes within the compliance space. Uh, there are news services, obviously, there are websites that talk about uh, different changes. I like, uh, you know, for, for PCI, I, I use PCI Guru. It's one of the ones that I like because you, you get the interaction with different people that are going through different problems. And if there's, uh, typically, if there's an issue that I'm faced with, I can search through that blog and find somebody else that has had that same question. So it's it's really helpful to me. But there's also many other sites, many user groups that you can be a part of uh, and, and just keep abreast of things that are changing. How about you? What do you do? I love the HCCA website. They have a nice forum. They have blogs. Um, 
And then we've built some stuff on to our website. We go to your website a lot for security information. Right uh, <laughs> I think we just, like you, we found trusted people that we know can actually give the information and we, we get it from there. Awesome. So we're still on the poll question slide. Can we advance to the, the next slide? There we go. Let's go one more. All right. So this this is the uh, the wall of shame. Sarah, do you want to talk a little about this a little bit? Oh, this is the place we all want to avoid. So if you have a breach of 500 folks or higher, this is where you're going to end up. And a lot of times when we look at the corrective action plans that come out of the investigations for being on this wall of shame, you're going to find like very similar things, lack of policies and procedures, lack of a security risk analysis, lack of encryption. And we see this over and over and over again, right? So this is one of the places where not only do you want to avoid, but you can actually come here to learn, like what are other people doing wrong? So you can avoid making their mistakes in your organization. Right, so, cause you don't wanna be a repeat offender on this list either. And we know that there are other um, walls of shame out there or ones that will be coming. So CMS is creating a wall of shame. The OIG has a wall of shame for fraud, waste, and abuse. So these are all walls we want to stay off of. They are called walls of shame because they are meant to be embarrassing and to shame you into not being back on this wall. Um, but a great thing is to actually learn from what other people are doing. I know like when I was growing up, I was the middle kid. I had a brother who was five years older than me. I always learned from his mistakes. That's I, right. I made my own new mistakes. <laughs> so this yeah. is the same type of concept. Learn from their mistakes. Let the wall Absolutely. of shame be your older brother. That's right. And and this is one of those uh, situations where you, you, you you don't want to, um, what's the advice? Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Yeah, be afraid to make a mistake. So learn what you can from these other people that have made mistakes. Yeah, there. you know what, sometimes it's gonna be um, unavoidable, but you certainly can uh, ask for advice, ask for help, and then learn from you know other people that have made mistakes. There's a, another website, I think it's called securitybreaches.net. And um, I don't think it's just healthcare specific, it's pretty broad uh, and you can learn a lot about uh, different technologies and, and what's happening in the security landscape. Let's go to the next slide. So here's the thing, right? You can uh, find pretty much anything you want to find on the internet. If there's a Facebook group out there, you can join that and, and just, I would suggest that you observe to start. Um, you really want to be careful about divulging too much of your intellectual property. Um, you do, certainly don't want to divulge what your vulnerabilities are. So um, if you ask about a specific vulnerability, you know, try and just, you know, don't say, hey, you know, we found out that we have this, you know, and um, because, you know, people are going to use that information to harm you. So you want to make sure that you keep your cards close to your vest. I, I know at Armor, you know, a lot of our vendors or a lot of our customers will come and say, hey, we want to see your security policies and we want to see the results of your penetration tests. And we have to tell them, no, we don't do that. We, we don't show you our configs. We don't show you the results of our vulnerability scans and we don't show you the results of our penetration tests because those things can lead to you know, uh, getting in the wrong hands. And then, and, you know, now they have a recipe uh, for hackers to come in and get to, to those spots where they know that you're vulnerable. So, you know, I, I recommend entities do the same thing. Keep those, keep those results, you know, absolutely remediate those results, but keep those results close to your vest and protect your confidentiality. Um, try, if you're going to engage in these uh, public groups, keep the conversation you know, at very high level, don't divulge too much. But, you know, you can you can search for podcasts, you can search for user groups. I know Facebook and LinkedIn are very, uh, very wealthy, if you will, in um, with regards to those groups. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, join a podcast about fly fishing. And I, I'm not kidding you, I probably found between 15 and 20 that were very interesting. So any topic that you want to search for, you can find. So and, and you don't be afraid about getting very specific about what you're looking for. 
And then, you know, you can take classes and certifications and then, you know, there's monthly roundtables. Sarah, do you know about any quality monthly roundtables that our audience might be able to join? Well, yes, Mike, I do. Um, so we actually started the HIPAA huddle a little over a year ago, and we've got about 500 compliance officers that rotate in and out. So we've got about 150 that show up any given month. And it's just a great time to come and ask questions and hear from your peers on how they're actually handling those. And so these kind of peer roundtables are actually really cool because not only do you get to learn from other people, but you also get to network and build that community because yeah. being a compliance officer, which I'm assuming a lot of people on this webinar are in compliance, um, can be very lonely. And a lot of times you're the only one in your organization that's like entrusted with that role. And so being able to network at these roundtables is key because um, then you can actually start to build relationships with people in other organizations that are, host, that are holding the same role as you. So you can, again, learn from one another, right? And take conversations off of, out, offline, out of these roundtables and move it into the real world. Um, and if you don't need a HIPAA huddle, right? You don't need a HIPAA uh, focused roundtable. They were really easy to get started. So you can start your own group or roundtable or mastermind or whatever you want to call them. I think there's a thousand names for these now, right? Yeah. But it's just a real life networking group that's meant to also provide education. Um, so I think that they are incredibly beneficial uh, to build and join with folks that are around your industry. And again, there are several out there. There are some that are more focused in security. Um, there are some that are more focused in privacy. The HIPAA huddle is just general HIPAA, so it covers everything. Um, yeah, and then the certifications, these are all of the industry standards for um, information security. Um, but there's also the HCCA and the AHIMA certifications for privacy and security that should definitely be considered if you are in healthcare. Um, so, yeah. Yep, I, I can tell you, I've uh, attended HIP, the HIPAA huddle several times and it is very, very interesting. And there's certainly very live interaction and good content. And I, the reason I think that these are so impactful for, for me is that, you know, you get an opportunity to understand that you're not the only one that's dealing with the, these issues and there's comfort in knowing that you're not the only one, right? So if, it, if it's a VTM problem where you're, you know, managing, you know, the vulnerability threat management program and it's just overwhelming, you're going to find that other people are dealing with the same thing. So um, I highly recommend those. Also, if you're looking for a podcast, Sarah, I know you also have a podcast that I think it comes out weekly, doesn't it? It did come out weekly. We're getting ready. We took a pause uh, for the the spring and we're getting ready to start back up again. And that um, podcast can be found on any uh, podcast channel and it's called Armchair HIPAA. That's and there's right. our conversations with compliance officers and compliance vendors. Like you can actually look in here, a podcast from Mike Annan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I hope to do another one soon. So let's uh, let's move to the next slide. Let's talk about some solutions for customizing family recipes. But before we do, we're going to do a poll. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics we're about to talk about. Are third party assessments currently part of your due diligence process? So when you are starting with a new third party vendor, are you assessing them for their compliance and security? Absolutely. We don't need those. A what now? So this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because in healthcare, so many people rely solely on the business associate agreement, which is what you need, but it's there's a whole process um, behind actually vetting your vendors. So I'd be really interested in knowing what y'all are actually doing during that vetting process to see if you are conducting these third-party assessments. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Yay. <laughs> Good. And then the second so, one was a what now, right? So that was the yeah. second highest one, 13% of people. So Mike, what is a third party assessment? Well, I'm glad you've asked. So we can look at a third party assessment in two ways, right? It's you 
assessing your vendors and the other side of the coin is having a third party come in and assess you right so and there's value in both of those but first let's attack that from you managing your vendors um, you can see here on this slide and also um, before i before i forget if you guys look at uh, the little control panel that you have for this webinar there's a section called handouts if you click the little carrot next to that and expand that the entire presentation today that we're giving all the slides are available for download as well as um, a case study so i just wanted to mention that before i forgot to do that so back to third-party assessments so the reason we do it is to identify potential risks that are you know posed by um, outsourcing some services to a third party whether that's uh you know having somebody view your radiology reports and you know give you a diagnosis and send that back you know it, you're you're using a third party to do that something outside of your organization and you're sending you know critical data to them so there's always going to be a potential risk there so you need to be sure that the the vendor is doing the right things with your data right so um look at their SOC 2 report if they have a high trust report look at that but also you know examine what they're doing you know you need to classify your vendors and assess the risks so you know that hey this is a solid provider you know they have been doing this for 30 years they've never had a breach that kind of thing but it, it, you know if they've only been doing it for five years and they've already had two breaches you know that's obviously a little bit more risky situation so you need to understand that you need to know what sort of service level agreements you have with them and these this is usually handled you know up front when you're negotiating your contracts um, so if you have service level agreements with them, you know, are you hold them accountable to those? You know, do you have some sort of reporting structure that's, you know, saying whether or not they're missing the mark as far as providing that service to you? And then you also need to determine uh, compliance requirements, not just for yourself, but also what are the requirements that this third party has and make sure that they're keeping up, you know, up to speed on those and they're not letting those certifications lapse. And then of course you need to query and audit select vendors and continuously monitor those things. You need to make sure that they're doing the things that they say they do, right? And I used an example in the dry run that if a third party says they have a three-legged monkey juggling bananas in the data center, when you visit the data center, you should see a three-legged monkey juggling bananas. And if you don't, then you need to question why they say they have this, but it's not, you know. So, right. and, you know, obviously if you have a BAA with, with your vendor, then you're completely covered and, and you don't have any responsibility, right? <laughs> uh, I'm no, uh, <laughs> so there could be some shared responsibility, right? And it really boils down to a couple different factors, right? Number one is what type of information are you sharing with this business associate, right? So obviously you're sharing some sort of PHI, but how sensitive is that PHI, right? right. If it's partially um, like de-identified, you know, and you're like only sharing like initials and zip codes, right? Which is what we used to do in the dialysis center was we would go and gather um, for the work that we did for, for prevalence work is we would gather initials and zip codes and diagnosis codes would be highly unlikely to be able to re-identify those patients but we were still gathering that information and there was still a liability there right and so the business associate agreement there it might you know protect us right but likely not um, as a dialysis unit for sharing that information outside of our organization so there it really just depends the sensitivity of the data it also depends like how much data is being like filtered back and forth right so is are you sharing thousands and thousands of records or are you sharing five records right so and then it also depends on this diligence process right did you properly vet your vendor right and by properly this means too like so to go back to the whole topic of this conversation you cannot have like a cookie cutter and go for every single vendor this is the survey we're going to be using right you have to have um like classifications of surveys, right? So for everybody who are going to be electronically transmitting PHI of this level, of this sensitivity, you know, we're going to do this type of survey for, you know, people who are gonna be messing around in our networks or hosting our data, we're gonna do this level of, of assessment. <laughs> Right, there's no such thing as a as a cookie cutter assessment. Now, then that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you have to go and create new surveys for every single vendor. You have to classify not just your vendors but your data. And when you understand 
like what type of data that you've classified that you're going to be sending to which classification of vendor, then you have a classification of the diligence process that you're going to be selecting and sending forward to, to them. Because the business associate agreement is not a get out of jail free card. It does not protect your organization. There are multiple examples where the OCR has fined both the business associate as well as the covered entity, because as a covered entity, it is ultimately your information and you have responsibility for how that is being you know, handled. Now then, depending upon your business like your business associate agreement as well as your contract with them you may be able to recover losses from a business associate generated breach however that is really up to your state regulation and how well your how good your attorney is because indemnification clauses in a business associate agreement will not stop the OCR from fining you fantastic that's that is good information right there Let's talk real quick about contingency plan and business impact assessment. I know we did this on our last webinar, but real quick, um, in order to protect the business, um, these these are pretty much the same thing, right? You don't have to do both. You could just do one or the other, right? Mike, how for quickly you forget our presentation <laughs> from last month. They are not the same. The contingency plan is an output of the business ass impact assessment, right? So your BIA will drive your contingency plan. Right? right, and if you have not done a BIA, then it is definitely something you should be doing because it is something that is organization wide, whereas your contingency plan will be data driven and it can be um, driven by business group, but more frequently it's done by classification of data, which you classify during your BIA process. There mm -hmm. is some overlap in that both of them require a testing of the, the outputs of both of these and revising as necessary because these are both ongoing activities. They are not checkbox, I've done my BIA, checkbox, I've done my contingency plan. These are things that you have to constantly monitor, constantly review, constantly move forward in advance with. That is absolutely true. Um, you can't, this is not something you'd be able to do in a week or two. It's an ongoing process, like Sarah said. Uh, things are going to be changing. You're going to have to adjust your business impact assessment or analysis as things are changing. And it should be something that you get really in depth with. And so you understand the organization, you know, what, what the organization is doing, how they're doing it, and how to protect those assets. Woo! All right. So, you know, when, when we're assessing our vendors, when we're creating our business impact analysis, there are things that we need to ask. You know, what are the top risks for your organization? What, um, what data is most valuable to your organization? Are you compliant with the frameworks that you are supposed to be compliant with? Do you have an effective security awareness program? Uh, what are we going to do if there's a data breach? And, you know, when you when was the last time you tested your program? So these are things that you should ask. Don't be don't be shy. These are things that are going to help you assess a vendor, right? If they're, you know, if they're saying, oh, yeah, we were SOC 2 certified back in 2015. We just haven't done it since. Well, OK, why? Why? Why haven't you done that? You know? Why are why are are you testing your incident response plan? If not, why not? Because something, you know, we talked about recipes being outdated to a certain extent, right? If you are not updating that plan and keeping it relevant to the technology that you're deploying today, then you're really doing yourself a disservice. Because the last the last thing you want to do is test the you know the validity of your incident response plan during a breach. You want to make sure that you are contacting the right people. You have a good, um, a good idea of what's the process for this particular type of breach, right? So, right. You know, we'll talk so a little I'd bit like more to, about that. Yeah, I like to boil this slide down in a way that I think a lot of people can understand, right? In the 1970s, we were told eggs were good for us, and then the 80s, we were said no, eggs are super bad. And in the 90s, we were told, eat eggs, but not the yolks, only the whites. 
right? So like, <laughs> things true. change really fast, right? So just like we don't know, are eggs good or bad for us? Can we eat the yolks or not the yolks? Like what's going on with the eggs? Right. That's exactly how your security program is too, right? It's not as crazy as the whole, can we eat eggs or not thing, but it's really goes down to like the information that we have changes and the threats change and if you're not routinely asking yourself these questions and you're just going off of old information are you leading yourselves up to a cybersecurity heart attack by eating those egg yolks i love eggs they're delicious i do too and i love runny eggs <laughs> all right yeah all right. let's move forward let's do it Okay, so um, the next section we're going to talk about substitutions, how not to skimp on the right ingredients, right? But before we do, we have a what? A poll question. That's right. All right, so how mature is your threat remediation process? Is it not a focus for you? Are you just getting started? We're enhancing our current process. We're ready for anything at any time. But Mike, wait, what, as people are answering this, what is a threat remediation what? process? What is it? Well, so obviously it's um, your vulnerability and threat management program. You're gonna have to scan your environments on a regular basis because, you know, technology is not a, a perfect thing, right? It's, it degrades over time, right? And that's why patching on a monthly basis is good because a lot of the patches that you install force you to restart and you know so an ongoing restart monthly reboots that's that's a good thing for your organization so when you think about your threat remediation program how are you identifying you know the things in your environment that might have vulnerabilities and then how are you assessing those vulnerabilities and then how are, are you patching or remediating those those vulnerabilities so think oh, about so the vulnerability scans yeah, so you're telling me that it's part of the risk management process. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's an ongoing thing. The thing about VTM is these people are the unsung heroes of any cybersecurity organization, right? Their job is never done, and it's just, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, month after month after month. So, you know, if you have an opportunity or you work with these folks, go say thank you because, honestly, that's tough work. and um, it is one of the easiest things that you can do on a regular basis to make your, you know, to create the baseline of security within your organization. I remember there was a company that I went to work for and I was shocked to find out that they hadn't patched anything in like three to four years. You know, we had individual servers with over 3000 individual patches that had to be installed. And I'm like, how, how does this happen? You know? Yeah, so look at our results here, Mike. So we have 67% of folks that are enhancing their current process, 22% awesome. just getting started, seven that are ready for anything at any time. That surprises Beautiful. me. And then yeah. it's not a focus for us. And I'm surprised well, that it's not a focus for us and healthcare is not a bigger number than it is. So yeah. um, honestly, I'm, I'm not surprised by um, we're enhancing our current process just because oh, I'm not either. Like I said, technology of... changes. So um, it's good to see that people are uh, rolling with the changes and, and looking at that process and evaluating it and making it better. And so that that's actually encouraging to me. I know I really everybody should have been in that bucket. Right. Because even if you think you're ready for anything at any time, you don't really know there's a new threat right around the corner and if you're not keeping an, your eye on the ball and you're not continuing to work on enhancing what you're currently doing you're going to be caught by surprise because that's like when you get overly confident in your abilities right and what you think you can do that's when you stumble because that confidence which is a good thing right i'm not saying confidence is a bad thing but when you become overly confident that's when you start to make mistakes because you think that you're untouchable right if we think back like into how like famous mobsters have gotten caught right it's because they were way too confident and they thought that they could never be touched and yep. that was ultimately their downfall and that's really what's going to happen with us if we're not continuing to look at it right and continuing to revise it right yep. so yeah you're absolutely right absolutely right 
So our current topic is talking about ingredients. Like, have you ever made cookies with a butter substitute? They just aren't good. They're just no. not good. They're not. So you got to know what's required. And, and, you know, a lot of times you look at people that talk about automation and, you know, you know, there's a big push for automation because, well, it makes things easier, right? But it doesn't always give you the right results. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, this is a nailed it or failed it situation, right? So you've got this really cool recipe from Pinterest that you think you can like do. It seems super easy. Other people have posted how well that they've been able to do this and then it just doesn't work for you, right? And it right. really does come down to you. you get what you pay for. If you've tried to substitute out other things or if you haven't properly evaluated that like solution for with your organization, you're going to end up with a weird fit, right? The margarine instead of butter taste of your cookies, right? Where they're edible, but they're not exactly what you were looking for, right? right. And then they get stale on the cabinet because nobody wants them. And then you end up throwing them out, but you've wasted all that time and money. And the cookie analogy is actually silly because throwing out a dozen yucky cookies cost you maybe five bucks, but implementing the wrong automation can cost your organization, you know, thousands, if not millions of dollars, depending right. upon the size of your organization and whether or not it causes a, a cyber incident or a security incident, which um, results in a breach. So making sure that there is a good fit for your organization, making sure that you have the tools necessary to implement it in the way that it means, and that there is stake, like key stakeholder buy-in, right? So Absolutely. time after time, most of the time, implementations will fail because you don't have buy-in throughout the organization. It is something that is being pushed onto you and it doesn't actually work. Now then when we talk about bad automation, um, automating certain tasks just can't be done. Some things have to be manual, like depending upon the size of your organization and what task it is, right? And some things need to be, like can be automated, but you still need to keep your eye on the ball, right? And that's how you're going to be able to tell whether or not it's working in your organization or not. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I see most often is the use of the standard change, right? So within within ITIL, you know, standard changes are supposed to be easily done, very repeatable, done many times in the past, and always always have a very high level of success. Um, but what we see is people want to circumvent the change management process by designating certain things as standard changing changes and that it becomes a disaster. So I would suggest that if, if you're doing that, you know, be really careful about the things, you know, and track the things that you're allowing to be standard changes because um, a lot of times those things need to have eyes on them and, and need to understand what the impacts are both upstream and downstream. So don't be afraid to ask the questions, if, you know, if you see a lot of standard uh, changes coming through. And, and of course, there's other things too that you will you'll run into where people have thought, hey, this is probably something we can save a little time on and implement, but uh, um, really it doesn't give you the quite the right results. So just be aware of that as you're moving forward. Let's go to the next slide. Sticky situations. Don't get your hand caught in the cookie jar. Let's. That's our next topic. But before we do. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't have a poll question, do we? Or do yes, we? we do. All right. Does your organization put a priority on compliance? It's not a focus for us. We want it to be, but no one sees it as a priority. And it's what drives our business. Right, so this poll question actually came out of a conversation I had recently with a hospital with a very frustrated HIM director who was also the privacy officer who said, no one cares about compliance and she was so frustrated because she was trying to get things done but nobody in her organization wanted to even talk about compliance she couldn't get her voice heard which is one of the most frustrating places to be is when you understand as the person responsible for compliance its importance and you cannot seem to shout loud enough to get your voice heard it's like yelling into a black hole 
Yeah, so where I, do you... I do understand the frustration that she's going through. That's that's tough. Oh yeah, wow, I am not 57%. surprised. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised by that um, being the biggest one. I'm super excited for the thirty for the forty three percent of people that say it's what drives our business. Good job. Yeah. I think that one of the things that it's really important to remember is that security, privacy, and compliance cannot be separated. Those three things like operate as one thing. Now then you can have one person that's responsible for your overall compliance, one person that's responsible for the security, one person responsible for the privacy. But if they don't operate as a single unit in a single force moving forward, then it will you will never fall into that 43% of folks that is what's driving their business. You have to make sure that those three are working together because one of the biggest problems we see, at least in healthcare, is the HIM departments are typically responsible for privacy. The IT departments are typically responsible for um, security. And then sometimes they'll have a compliance officer, sometimes not. Um, and then, but those two, <laughs> like HI privacy and security always seem to be at odds with one another and really those two need to work symbiot like very symbiotically because you can't have privacy unless you're protecting the security you cannot protect your security unless you're focused on the privacy no you're absolutely right I, you know a lot of people feel like oh if i if i focus on security then compliance and privacy will be a byproduct of that and that is absolutely not true because there are you know security is very task oriented right and i i have used this analogy with you before but i liken it to you know home security right where you can have locks on your doors and cameras and you can have a fence around the perimeter of your property which you know if I told you these things, you would say, oh, well, you know, that's that's pretty decent security for a household. But if I if if I invited you over and you saw that the fence was only two feet high and that the cameras were never powered on and nobody was engaging the locks at the end of the day, well, you say, well, what's the purpose of that? I mean, the security is there, but the compliance is not right. Compliance would say, hey, that fence needs to be six feet high. Somebody needs to turn those cameras on and needs to actually check the footage. And then at the end of the day, a manual process of somebody going around to each of the windows and doors and engaging those locks and then check, signing off that you've done it that day. Right. Exactly. Those are the those are kind of the kind of things. So you're managing not just technology, you're managing people and you're managing process, right? And with the privacy element, you're you're managing the data that you collect and how you yeah. collect it. Yeah. So compliance is an oversight, right? And so and I always have a when we go into the hospitals and clinics and so forth, we see a lot of times the IT department's responsible for the security. Great. But those IT people have so much else on their plate, just like the HIM department has a lot on their plate to worry about privacy as well. And so without somebody actually overseeing what's being done, your IT department will take shortcuts and end up with like what's on our next slide, which is, Gwen? The 10 <laughs> biggest blunders to avoid. Yes, like this so is what's what going to happen when you don't have proper oversight. Right, and we're not gonna read through all of these for you, but we're gonna cover a couple of our favorites. I'll go first. Okay. Um, I'll, treating all data the same and failure to segment data. This is very, very important. So you need to classify your data. And, and when I say that, you need to, seriously, you need to define what is public. You know, what does it mean to classify something as public? Define what, what does it mean if it's something is private? What does it mean if it's confidential? And what does it mean if it's restricted, right? And then you go and look at all of your information assets and you label the things that you have, whether that's a report, whether that's a, a, you know, a report from an assessment like a SOC 2 report, Armour, makes those confidential. We will share them with our customers, but we make sure that there are um, contractual protections over that because really it's a recipe for everything we do at Armour, right? So it shows you how we run our business, the tools we use and how we use them. And, and so in the wrong hands, you know, that could really hurt us. So we want to make sure that we take care of that data. So we classify, you know, that as, as confidential. And then, you know, like I said earlier, our penetration tests, those are restricted. We do not share those externally. And so this is how you should be operating. You should know the data that you have. And then let me talk real quick about segmentation. Segmentation is very important. You don't, you don't want to have everything sitting on the same network without 
network protections, right? Um, when I used to audit to explain to people uh, what security was, I would do it in uh, with the security onion, right? The cross section of onion, it looks like a big target with concentric circles. So the outside is your perimeter security, and then inside you have maybe your network security and then server security application database. And then at the very center is your data that you're trying to protect, right? And each of those layers as you come in should be a layer that's a speed bump or stops somebody. Anybody that has direction all the way in or access all the way in, that's an issue, right? So think about those things as you're creating your infrastructure or your environment. Sarah, you wanna talk about one? Uh, well, I, first of all, I wanna say like, don't over segment your data either though, cause we've seen the opposite oh, yes. of no segmentation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, it's gotta night. be usable and accessible, right? So, right. For sure. All right, which brings me to allowing privilege access out of convenience. So many times we come in and the C-suite have access to everything, yeah. right? Who do you think is the target of all of these phishing attacks and all of the, you know, spoofing and stuff? It's your C-suite, right? Yeah. Their C-suite emails will be spoofed more often than any other person inside of your organization. And if they have access to everything out of convenience for them, then you're setting yourself up for a major security breach. It is not, um, it's actually not even HIPAA compliant because inside of HIPAA, you have to have a, a business need to have access to that information. So yeah. really think about privilege and setting up not just minimum necessary use, right? But who needs access to what system? I would do it by job role and have a legitimate business need that is outlined as to why they need access to, to those records, right? Absolutely. And it goes back to, it's very similar to what Mike was just talking about with your data and making sure that it's properly classified and you've properly segmented it. The same thing is true with your privileges. They have to be properly classified and properly like administered out. And you need to have a process in place for elevating privilege. So if you have somebody that change jobs and they need a new privilege, then you have to have a process in place for that to modify their access. And that's actually required by HIPAA. So if you don't have that process in place, you need yeah. to get that in place, not just for yeah. security best practice, but because HIPAA requires you to. The next one I'd like to talk about is retaining unnecessary data. Um, we are very lax in the United States about, you know, restrictions on what data companies can uh, collect in in Europe. I know that they have to have a specific meaning for each data point that they co collect. And the moment they no longer have that need for that data point, they have to delete that data. Or if they want to repurpose it, they have to go back to the data owner, which is your your customer or whoever it is that is the you know the person that the data refers to. And you have to ask permission again. Say, hey, you know, we we're using your social security number last year for such and such a purpose, but you know, that purpose is gone. We need to still use it for this purpose. Is that okay? Do you give us permission? And if they say no, then you have to wipe that data. So that's Europe and I think that's great. But here it's a little bit more of the wild, wild west. We collect anything and everything that we can get our hands on. And what does that do? That makes the breaches that much more impactful when it happens. And if you look at the numbers, I think a breach in the United States, uh, the, the financial impact of a breach in the United States is twice that of the European Union. So yeah. I suggest you, if you if you don't have a purpose for collecting somebody's social security number, then don't collect it. You don't need it. If, if you don't have a viable reason for collecting, it just makes it much more difficult to maintain that data, right? And, right. And your breaches are more impactful, so. So I actually wanna add on to your points, right? So if you're a hospital or a clinic and you have records from the 1970s of patients who've been dead for 30, 40 years, sitting in your basement, those paper records, you have no idea what's down there. Somebody can be stealing those and stealing the identity of dead people, which happens more often than you think, and you can actually be held liable for that. If you do not need that record any longer, destroy it. We were actually just talking to an FQHC yesterday who was telling us that they keep CD-ROMs of patient records um, that have been sent over over the last years, just in case the doctor needs to look at them. And I asked one question, 
do any of your computers have the ability to read a CD-ROM anymore? Oh, no? no Why do you have yeah. a CD-ROM? Destroy that information. You have no yeah. way of converting that information. The doctor has no way of looking at it. However, somebody can get their hands on that and there are ways to still read a CD-ROM and that information is now going to be breached. It is very, very important that you destroy not just electronic data that you no longer need, but paper data. That's that's really important. And we talked about the data classification policy. You should also have a data retention policy that also instructs you know your folks how to to safely destroy that data, whether you know whether it's physical, you know, printed out on paper or if it's electronic data. So um, if you are lacking those policies and procedures, you need to go ahead and get those in place as well as uh, the data classification. I know I piggybacked on yours instead of talking about mine, which was failure to train employees about security risks, because that's so important. And I know like anybody who's ever heard Michael or I talk, we beat that dead horse like every yeah. time we can, because that's such an important one. It really is. You know, the security and compliance of your organization is not just the responsibility of the security compliance teams. It's everyone's responsibility. And if you're not training your folks on how to manage that data, how to be skeptical when they're opening an email that might be a phishing email, then you're really doing yourself an injustice because this is one of the ways that you can have the biggest impact for the lowest cost in your organization. It's and, and a lot of times organizations will just want to check that compliance checkbox, you know, and they'll do it in January and then that's it. They don't think about it again until next January when that compliance need comes up again. But really we should be having, you know, quarterly campaigns, focus on HIPAA in the first quarter, focus on password protection in the second, you know, focus on, you know, credit card data in the third, if that's what you want to do, but keep people engaged and create a culture of compliance and security through security awareness training. Exactly. Yep. All right, let's move on. So here's some uh, best practices for defense. I'm going to run through these real quick. I know you guys can read, but uh, we'll just we'll just hit the highlights here. So you have to have an asset inventory. And why do you need that? Well, because if you don't know what you have, you can't protect it, right? You need to know all of the assets and who owns them so that you can track uh, when there's an outage on a particular uh, asset, you can understand what are the downstream and upstream effects of that outage, right? And who do you need to contact in order to get that uh, back online, right? And so if you don't have a configuration management database, you probably need to think about getting one. The problem happens is a lot of people create this monolithic CMDB where they have all these assets and it's huge. It may have 10,000 different CIs in there. And the problem is, is that becomes very difficult to manage. People come and go from the organization. So let people manage their asset inventory and then federate that up into a bigger system. Make sure that if the different teams are using uh, the, the record or the, the system of record for managing those systems, right? If, if let's say the sales team has their own asset management thing and they do it on a spreadsheet that nobody else has access to, that's not good for the organization. So think about how you're managing your assets, make sure that they're all available and everybody's using the same source, very important. We talked about vulnerability scanning and patching. You gotta do that in order to keep a baseline of security within your organization. We wanna limit the data that we retain because that minimizes the impact of a breach if it, do, if it does happen. Um, login data management is very important, right? It's how security knows when there's something wrong in the environment. They can see anomalies within an application that may be doing things that it should not be doing, right? So how good is your log and data management? Um, examine that, know what you're doing and let your IT teams dictate how the logging should be done. How long should you retain those records, right? Network segmentation, very important, right? It's how we keep things in secure. We talked about that through data uh, segmentation as well. Make sure you're doing a business continuity plan, right? One of the uh, pillars of HIPAA is the availability of data. And if you have a data center that goes out, that's a HIPAA violation, right? If that data is not available when it's needed, that's a HIPAA violation. So just make sure that you are exercising those plans. You don't want to find out that your plan is inactive or, uh, excuse me, inadequate during an outage. And then of course, you gotta have decent password management program. 
I know that was a lot. I said I was going to rip through that, but you did run too, Mike. You were like, let me just take off running. Like you, it's a lot of that. I don't want to put people to sleep with all that stuff. And a lot of this stuff is common sense, folks. So again, don't be shy about downloading this presentation. So you have this to refer to. Let's look at the next slide. So what do you do if you have a breach? Okay, so this is one I got on my soapbox a little bit yesterday during our dry run. So I will make sure I keep this a little bit shorter. All right, so your IRP, again, is not a cookie cutter. You are not going to respond to a breach. The, if it's a ransomware breach, the same as you're going to respond to a botnet breach or a denial of services breach, you need to make sure that your IRPs are customized for to your threat management or your threats you've identified on your risk analysis or in your business impact assessment or whatever you're calling it, your evaluations. Um, there's a thousand different names for them, right? But you need to make sure that you are looking for and identifying risks based off of your vulnerabilities and your industry. So if you're in healthcare, your number one cybersecurity threat right now is ransomware. Um, and so you need to have an IRP on how you're going to actually uh, recover from ransomware, taking into consideration what if it's a double extortion threat, what if it's now a triple extortion threat, which now we have, what are your steps you're going to take, you know, because even, even from training your employees, which should be part of your uh, employees should be trained on your incident response plans on what their role is, because if you have a ransomware attack and your employees don't know that the very first thing that they need to do is unplug that machine or power it off if it's a mobile device, like before they call IT, before they contact their supervisor, before they do anything, then your the pulverization the of that attack is going to be much deeper into your network than if they had just unplugged it to begin with, right? But Absolutely. your response to a denial of services attack is going to be different, right? So my machine, machine is running slow or I can't access these things, then sure, call IT, that's the appropriate response. So the thing is, is your IRP should really be from the very beginning, right? The employee notices something's wrong, what do they do? All the way up to how you report that to your state and federal regulatory bodies. So most states require HIPAA breaches to be reported to the state attorney general's office as well as to the OCR. Um, and then beyond, how are you going to actually mitigate and do that follow up? So you can have you know three or four different IRPs because you can have, it's not like you have to have an IRP for each individual threat ransomware should have its own but you can have a broad class of threats like denial of service yep. which will include a lot of different threats you can yeah, have this is a good place for a decision tree at the beginning of your irp so that they can direct them to the right process yeah exactly mike yeah i promise so, not to get on my soapbox and then i was starting to so thank you for pulling me down <laughs> no no it's good i know that you're very passionate and i and i'm sure our audience can feel it because because that you know that's what really drives us all, right? Um, is the passion that we all have for for compliance and security. It's crazy. We're, we're very weird people. Um, <laughs> we are coming up on the hour, so I want to jump through these really quickly. Let's talk real quick about uh, the key takeaways that we have here. So, um, review your policies and procedures annually. You know, don't stick with the same recipes that worked, you know, 30 years ago. Make sure that you're keeping abreast of the things that are changing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you should at least have wheels, right? So just you know, know what works for your organization and make sure that it's sound. Know your organization and implement what's best and then understand why others fail and learn from their mistakes. Let's look at some of the resources that we have available for folks here so we can get to some Q&A. All right, so for Armor, uh, we have the vital access study case. We have how to manage the vendor uh, the cloud vendor for HIPAA compliance, and then the cloud migration checklist. Which I love that cloud migration checklist. We've used it inside of HIPAA Trek multiple times. Awesome. And there are a uh, wealth of other things at armor.com forward slash resources. For HIPAA Trek, we have, um, Sarah, why don't you talk about what we have here? Yeah, so we obviously have the HIPAA huddle, which we talked about. Uh, we have a plethora of information on our website, including a community that you can join for free. Um, we can give you a demo of our uh, 
our application, which has inside of it our breach risk assessment tool, as well as a ton of other valuable tools to help you manage your compliance. All right. So at this time, we'd like to take a few questions from the audience. If you have not already submitted your question, uh, please use the question function. I see that somebody's already saying that they're having a problem uh, getting to the uh, the presentation PDF. So we'll get that worked out. Um, while you're submitting your questions, I, I do want to ask all attendees to participate in a quick survey. Or no, yeah, uh, I think we have a survey for today's webinar. Do we not? I think we do. I'm going to assume that we do. Um, it helps us uh, if you can give us some feedback on the things that you heard today, if the topic was relevant, how the pre presentation and this tool work. Um, we want to make sure that we're providing you know, pertinent information to you, and we want to make sure that it's coming to you in an easy-to-consume format. And if you have recommendations, please don't hesitate to, to send those to us because it helps us get better at what we want to give to you, which is um, you know, in good quality information on compliance and security. So let's see, I don't see any questions. Come on, people, come on, we one. have two minutes. There's one, um, thank you for the guidance on this important issue regarding the A Foundation, fundraising, CRM, not the EMR. Can you both address what you are seeing regarding compliance and the process needed for vendors to access non-PHI? different than other areas, why or why not? I'm gonna let you handle that. I don't know what they're, I didn't. I, I know, know I was struggling asking. with what this is. So CRM, I think of customer relationship management software versus right. an EMR. And so why would a vendor need to see my CRM information? I would likely never give anybody information, like, like access to that information because it is highly confidential um, information, right? So mm -hmm. I would never grant access to my CRM um, and vendors to access non-PHI. Well, again, I we have vendors that don't access the PHI that we have inside of our systems, Armor being one of them, right? So we are a client of Armor. We have PHI inside of our our platform and Armor never accesses our PHI. However, we do right. have a business associate agreement still with Armor because there is a small chance that that could happen. Um, but yeah, I don't really, maybe you can clarify the question. Where are you getting the question? I'm only seeing the one about the handout not being downloadable. Um, it was from Randall Hallett. Um, thank you for guiding. And then there's another oh, one. Great presentation, oh, yeah. thank you. FedRAMP is now requiring government and FedRAMP authorized companies to perform third party uh, security assessments, providing documentation as part of the acquisition process. That is true. Um, and here's the thing is even though you're required to do the third party security assessments, right? That third party should not be required to disclose like all of their documentation for it, right? What they've done for their security processes. It should just be a questionnaire, yes or no. You can ask for some documentation, right? But um, you don't need to provide everything there. Um, and part of the, yeah. So the documentation of the security risk assessments can really just be the output, right? So we conducted this security risk assessment because you don't want to provide all of the documentation. Is FedRAMP requiring all the documentation, Mike? Do you know? I do not know. I didn't but know. But that's something that we can take back and, and uh, get the answer for and get them uh, an answer offline. Yeah, there we go. Let's see, I'm looking through here. Hi, thanks for the fantastic handout. It's not working. Well, gosh. Um, yeah, we're going to make sure that we get the, a good copy of the slides to you guys today. Uh, let's see, FedRAMP. Yeah, you just went over that one. And that is a very small window for me. I want to want to make that bigger. I know I was struggling with that too. Like, and then I'm blind. So yeah. <laughs> see. Um, so any other questions, y'all? We still have about, we'll give it like one more minute maybe. 
here goes, oh, my favorite person, Melissa, hello. Melissa is actually one of our most active folks on the HIPAA huddle, amazing, amazing resource for anybody who needs it. Um, we are in the process of a merger. The first section of the merger, they are reviewing our billing practices. Do we need more than a BAA? Um, that really depends on how the documentation is written, right? So I know that more than likely during most m and processes, there is an NDA that is signed, a non-disclosure agreement that is signed at the, before any diligence process starts to go into place. Um, that NDA does not cover sharing protected health information. However, that protected health information um, can be disclosed underneath several different types of agreements, the business associate agreement being the most favorable. Um, make sure that there is some sort of privacy for the patient information inside of the NDA. So most NDAs are overly broad. And so we see healthcare merger NDAs being much more specific. So I would definitely take a look at that NDA and see that it includes um, statements for how they're going to adhere to the BAA. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Um, you'll, you'll need some sort of non-disclosure agreement. A lot of people feel, you know, I've, I've run into vendors before that feel like their NDA is so strong that they don't have to sign a BAA. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I yeah. think at any time that they're going to have access to data, they're going to have to sign that BAA. But I think, yes, the NDA is what you're going to have to have. And I would do that before you even start um, having them examine, a, you know, your billing system. Unfortunately, right. we are over time, so we really do need to get out of here. I was told that we we're going to email all of the, the handouts and um, artifacts that we have for you, including the slide presentation. Uh, so um, hopefully we have a good email address for you. If not, please contact me at armormike.annan at armor.com. Um, I'll be happy to help you out any way I can. Um, let me just say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you specifically to you, Sarah. I know your time and expertise is very valuable and I really do appreciate it. I really do enjoy the opportunity to, to talk with you. Um, and we've done it, what, three or four times already. So it's fantastic. I hope to do it again. Again, uh, please visit armor.com or hippotrek.com for the case studies and white papers that uh, we mentioned earlier. And um, I'm pretty sure we have a survey, so please help us out with that as well. Thank you again for joining. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.